click on the on the DM, whatever link to join as a speaker, you know this by now, Andrew Shelley. So, uh, we know you're listening, but Andrew, okay, there he comes. Mr. Andrew, yes, Robert. Mr. Andrew Mwenda, good evening. The old man of the clan. Welcome to African Speak, and uh, I don't know why it's taken so long for us to have this conversation. Aha, you must ask the speech of our ancestors. <laughs> Well, you know what that means. It means me and you will have to go climbing a mountain in order to have that conversation with the ancestors. So get ready. I am always, I'm always at your disposal, sir. Very good. Andrew, uh, people are already seated and waiting to listen. So let's get started and get right through into, your, into the conversation. Well, Andrew, you wrote a very, very interesting analysis of the Chitezi tragedy. And for those who may be listening and wondering what that's all about, about two or so weeks ago, uh, a landfill where Kampala's waste was being dumped, collapsed, and is believed to have covered well over 80 people to their deaths, uh, and it's created a huge uh, crisis for us uh, in the city of Kampala, not just waste management, but all of the implications. And we discussed that last week on Monday. However, the article that Andrew wrote for The Independent in his column raised very, very interesting um, national issues. And Andrew... I would like to start by uh, quoting for you, reading verbatim from your article. And I think that would be a really good entry point for us to start in order to understand the tragedy of Chitezi. And I'm going to read your last paragraph. That's where I want to start. And you say, in conclusion to your article, that the money-making and vote-buying culture that has engulfed our country, in brackets Uganda, has progressively eliminated public-spirited individuals from public life. It has led to the success of crooks seeking personal gain. This corrosion of the public ethic is rooted in the philosophy that governs our economics and has now captured our politics. Therefore, discussion of Chitezi must be integrated into the discussion of the overall management crisis of this country. Chitezi is not the first and won't be the last national disaster. Many are going to follow, perhaps with worse consequences. I really pray. That, the, that my analysis and predictions are wrong because future generations of Ugandans will be happy that I was wrong. Andrew, please yes. do contextualize this for us. Chitezi and this picture that you paint. Let's start there. You see, three things have converged to create a very risky governance crisis in Uganda. What are those? Let me begin with the first. You see, the NRM revolution, make it a background. The NRM revolution was born in a moment of great hope. Yeah. And I have written before that it's difficult for me to capture the, the emotional tone of the moment when NRM came to power. Yes. Remember, NRM came to power after five years of a Bush struggle, mm. where lives were sacrificed, people shed yep. blood, mm. people abandoned their properties and businesses, others mm. abandoned their families. The president is one big example. Mm. Others lost their limbs. General Salim Salim is another example. Others quit their educations. Mushega, Kale Kaihura, and others are good examples. Mushega was, mm. had enrolled as a PhD student at LSE. So mm. the sacrifices that were made were humongous. It is difficult for anyone to argue that these people were driven by self-interest of power. You can clearly see that this was a revolution driven by high ideals to fight mm. uh, corruption and tyranny and incompetence, to bring about a democratic and free society and mm. to create a government that was accountable and clean and uh, honest and serves the people. They were driven now, by idealism. A, exactly. This is a revolution that was born of high ideals, mm. and the public expectations were very high. Mm. But immediately these guys came to power, mm. Mm. and I think because of another context I don't want to go into, but because of the economic pressures they faced, mm. initially out of desperation they accepted IMF and World Bank uh, ideas on how mm. to run the economy. But I felt up to now, over time I've come to believe, Robert, mm. that the ideological foundation of neoliberalism, which became the guiding philosophy of Uganda, mm. in many ways laid mm. the foundation for the destruction of the public spirit in the public life. At that point, mm. it was argued that, if, that the state is inherently corrupt and incompetent, mm. and that the only way to resolve issues of state incompetence and corruption in public enterprises and other areas mm. was to privatize and to liberalize. So if a public enterprise was run by people who are corrupt or incompetent, the solution was never to improve management and bring about honest and more accountable leadership. It was to sell it to the private sector in the hope that the marketization of the economy will liberate it from state corruption. Right. But you see, that philosophy and it, and, over time and it's spread. Big, didn't it? I mean, well, if you, compare, if, if you can think about it, Robert, what it did, yes, it achieved what I would call short-term tactical gains at the price of long-term ideological distortions, because it okay. undermined the idea that people can go into public service to pursue collective goals, 
to pursue the good of society, that the good of society could only be realized through competition, selfish competition in the market, rather than idealism in the state. Okay, and that's I'm my waiting. point. I'm waiting so, for you. <laughs> so that philosophy, once it gained the ground, that when you go to the public sector, you go there to pursue your own selfish ends, now came and also through what we call contagion effect, it came and entered politics. It was all, it, it took root at a time when we were democratizing, which meant that for you to capture power, you had to have money. The marketization of politics, rather of economics, led to the marketization of politics. You can see all during the 90s and early 2000s, public spirited politicians of the uh, Kategaya type, Rakan Al-Gud and others, progressively quit politics and stopped running for parliamentary elections. And increasingly, those who are willing to sell their property, mortgage their homes, borrow money from loan sharks, and enter political competition are the ones who joined. So over time, the two reinforced each other. The marketization of the economy led to the marketization of politics, and the marketization of politics led to the erosion Andrew, of the public ethic. Mm. Andrew, let me first stop you there, because, uh, look, we all know the, 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 the econo- parts of the economy that were privatized. Number one, let me even start with the one in which I operate, the coffee sector. I mean, coffee marketing board never used to pay farmers. Now, people go and buy coffee from farmers directly, and at least they get paid. Two, mm. we, all the breweries which were owned by government, now, if you ask any alcoholic consumer, the, the guy is spoiled for choice. Telecoms, banking, you name it. They, those sectors are better run, way better run than the government. So it can't be blamed on, on that. But having said that, I want you to explain to us what then has happened to the what, whatever the co- historical context? What is it now, Andrew, today, that leads us to the Chitezi kind of outcome? Okay, so so I was coming to the third angle oh, of that. Right. Of course, the marketization of economics and the marketization of politics. Okay. But the the question, question, I, feel, politics, I will return to you because I think it started differently. The moment we went into, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the reform agenda split of two thousand, and then the the monetization of politics uh, when we went to multi-party and elective politics, popular politics. But anyway, let's. You so I was telling you, to just answer your first, the first part of your question, yeah. is that it is true that uh, the liberalization and privatization of the economy mm. created new efficiencies in the private sector mm. at the price of undermining the public spirit, because the ideological justification was actually wrong. The idea was that the state is inherently corrupt and incompetent and can't do anything. Mm. So if you create such an ideology as the founding philosophy of running a country, mm. then then you should not be surprised when it happens. You should not be surprised when roads in Kampala fall apart because the state is inherently corrupt and incompetent. I felt that we could justify liberalization and privatization without demonizing the state, without undermining the belief that through our collective actions, we can pursue socially profitable goals for this country. Anyway, let me come on. Okay. Okay. Realize that over time, Museven has been managing this mountain of crisis. Initially, he had a lot of energy mm. and zest. Mm. And uh, while he had unleashed a lot of chaos, he had incredible skill and tenacity to keep it under control. Mm. Now, turning eight the next month, mm. he has grown old and tired. Mm. He's ideologically and physically and mentally exhausted. Mm. He cannot exercise the same amount of energy, focus, time to supervise this whole chaos that was unleashed on Uganda. Mm-hmm. And as he has grown older... Mm. In the market is the politics and the market is the economy. New social forces, new interest groups, new power centers have emerged mm. and they are vying for his attention. Mm. As you grow older, many people tend to retreat to close family and friends. He has also retreated to the same, uh, the same issue. So mm. what has happened is a very small stack of people are able to gain access to state house mm-hmm. so that the management of the affairs of state is diverted from whatever public goal could have been imagined to pursue their private ends of making money. So they can go and sell him, you can see in my article, they can go and sell him uh, wrong ideas. This country, we are living in a city, Robert, that has literally collapsed in practically every aspect of existence. How do you mean? Whether it's, uh, whether it's, it's on roads, mm-hmm. it's drainage, mm-hmm. it's wetlands, uh, uh, it's uh, health infrastructure, mm-hmm. and now it's garbage collection, as you can see. Every single thing that you can imagine that's supposed to be provided by the public, uh, by the state in the capital, has deteriorated and in some cases collapsed. Now, Robert, remember mm. that Museveni, for whatever criticism I can make of him, mm. I disagree with his critics. He has presented over a rapidly growing economy. Mm. This rapidly growing economy has created a large and educated and articulate middle class that is even exposed. Today, you can drive from Kampala city center all the way to Namugongo, all the way to Entebbe, or to Mukono, and you see buildings and factories and new investments taking place in the private sector. You would expect that that kind of private investment would generate tax revenues to really fund infrastructure in the city. But what we are seeing is that somehow, while Kampala may need about $2 trillion to fix this infrastructure in the next five years, we see $750 billion 
being given to uh, Magwala to build a, a pharmaceutical plant. Not that I think that is, that is a wrong idea in and of itself. We can argue the other things about it. But is it the first thing you do in a dysfunctional city? Uh, we, can, uh, we are giving $200 million, uh, 200, uh, we gave $376 million for Boa Hospital. When we had just invested money in refurbishing Mulago and we had a commission that can't do a highly specialized hospital. Mm, you see, mm. are those projects coming Andrew. because of their economic value or because someone politically well connected is able to leverage the state, especially, specifically actually the president, to ensure that public money is thrown at these but, but Andrew, So I think Andrew, that. Let me, mm, let me stay with you on this issue. Just today, today, mm. the headline uh, in the New Vision, and I, I don't know if the monitor carried the same story is that the president has said that interns should sponsor their own internship because there's no money in government to fund their internship. The same, yes. the same president forced, or, well, sent back a budget to parliament and told them what he wanted, which included the provisions for those private investments that you're talking about. The yes. same president has watched as MPs spent 20 billion shillings running around the country supposedly to debate legislation in up country. It's basically a holiday, a paid for holiday. And all of these are the consumerist excesses by public officials. How does he reconcile that? And how would you reconcile that with what you're saying about exonerating him from the problems that we see? Because he's the chief manager of the economy, the budget. So he's the well, one... I don't who... know whether I'm exonerating him. In fact, I think that uh, he is the uh, the culprit number one. Mm. Because these are decisions that are made personally by him. There is no decision to get public money and give it to private investors mm. that has not been taken by him personally. Mm. So he is culprit number one, if anyone wants to criticize yeah. that is one. Two, I should even add for you, Robert, mm. right now, UNRWA, Uganda National Roads Authority, yeah. has certificates of roads that have been, construction that has been, te- that has taken place. Mm. And people are supposed to be paid worth 1.2 trillion shillings. Okay. 1.2 trillion shillings is unpaid. Mm. Of that 1.2 trillion, 730 billion is interest accruing certificates. Uganda wow. pays 350 million shillings per day as interest on these unpaid certificates. That's roughly 120 billion a year. In other words, just the cost of interest on unpaid certificates alone uh-huh. is more than what can build a road or can fix a lot of things in the campaign. Mm-hmm. But this quarter, I can tell mm. you, the Minister of Finance allocated UNRWA for purposes of building roads and maintaining them, shillings one billion. You may think that I'm making a mistake. Sorry, say that again. I mean shillings one billion. This quarter is the money that is given for road development to Uganda National Roads Authority. One billion. I don't think it can even fill a payroll. Imagine that. So this tells you that you have a public sector that is being starved of funds in very critical areas, as you say, for interns in hospitals, for roads that are falling apart. But you find money to invest in these private companies that you're setting up businesses there. In a context where it was your original idea hmm, that the state should be getting out of business in the, from the business of doing business, but into the business of providing public infrastructure. So this financial year... Mm or at least this quarter, I know, and next quarter, you know, I'm likely to receive money. So, all road construction contracts across Uganda are on a standstill. Contractors are even abandoning construction sites for roads. But we have somehow money to allocate so many of these private individuals. It's mind-boggling. So, what is causing that? That's why I was saying that the ethic of public service, the ethic of the good of Uganda has been sacrificed because putting money in these private ventures, I think, must bring handsome returns to the individuals who sponsor these projects at State House. But, Andrew, they go. Andrew, mm. it's a contradiction. But it can't be that the failure is as a result of the end of pub- good public ethic because UNRWA is, has some of the highest ethical standards. I mean, you could say that it's led by a very competent and ethical person. Surely, it is a problem of the political management of resources, this misallocation and these failures that are causing these problems. I don't think that public officials are inherently bad people. I mean, you yourself, you say, Andrew, in your second paragraph, and you say that some parts of our state acquired and over time improved high levels of administrative competences, Adam Seven, institutions like National Water, NSSF, Housing Finance, URSB, UNRWA. And I'd like to say that National Water has actually just disconnected Luzira for 80 billion shillings. So, Luzira Prison. Yes, there is a, le- a memo which was written, I saw it circulating, it's written by uh, Vaine, their spokesperson, explaining that, you know, somehow National Water reneged on an agreement, disconnected them for 18 billion. Luzira Prison alone owes 18 billion shillings to National Water. So you can imagine. So, but Robert, yeah. does that really, does that affirm my point? One, first of all, I'm sure money is not being given to UNRWA because if you give it to UNRWA, you are not likely to steal it. So, better not put it there. 
but you can put money in these other private ventures where you can steal it. In any case, there I say some institutions have retained good competencies, but these institutions are islands of competence and efficiency in a large sea of incompetence and corruption. So they are the exception, not really, I would, call, I would not say the norm. There are many institutions. There are many parts of the state of Uganda where you find public secret individuals trying really to do something good. But I feel like they are fighting rearguard action. They are on the losing end of things. They are not the mainstream. The mainstream is that Uganda has, we have what you can call a cash and carry government. What's that? What's <laughs> <laughs> a cash and carry government? <laughs> yes, that's where we have reached. And it is, it is so sad for me to be uh, arriving at this conclusion, in large, in large part because I would, do, in uh, normal circumstances, have wished mm. to say something positive about the current state of affairs in Uganda. Mm. Look, Robert, this problem of Kitezi did not begin yesterday. Yeah. Kitezi was totally filled up 11 years ago in 2013. Yes. It was recommended that it should be closed and a new one opened. Yeah. I know private firms that came and said they want to use Kitezi to generate, they call it biogas, to generate gas yes. or electricity from that place. Methane or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Yes. This is uh, up 2019, there were proposals like that. Up even two, two, two years ago. Mm. I know that the contrast, what many people think, Officials at KCCA have always argued the Minister of Finance, have put it to government. We need to fix the problem of cases. We need money. Mm -hmm. Money was not provided. Whatever money was provided was available could only do what we would call palliative measures. But it could not resolve the problem that you had a, 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 a garbage uh, dump mm -hmm. that was overused. It had grown into a mountain and the landfill that was being used had been totally consumed almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. No action was taken. So warnings were given. The KCC kept over the years, when reminding the Minister of Finance and whoever mattered, and n never was money provided in the budget to have this issue of garbage sorted. I should tell you, uh, uh, mm. just about to behind Bugolo, mm. that swap mm. from here at the industrial area, fifth street, yeah. all the way to Lake Victoria, yes. people have been overtaking the swamp there, putting in factories, building in every single thing. Warehouses. Recently, last year, mm. no, when did, before Keith McCannis died, he called me and said, Andrew, can you help us? There's a crisis here. Mm. A man had been given, I think, 15 acres or 21 acres and was building. He was backfilling the swamp with, he had about 100 lorries at night pouring, backfilling the swamp. Mm -hmm. So I called the uh, Major General uh, Geoffrey Katsigazi at that time. Mm. He was uh, the Deputy Inspector General of Police. Mm. I called uh, the Deputy Director General, uh, Deputy Executive Director of KCC. Mm. I called the head of uh, NEMA. And uh, I even said, let us deploy here and stop this from happening. When we reached there, Keith was, campaign was complaining about just one place. Mm. But we found so many others developing. We had to go and shut them down. Now imagine me. I don't have any job in the government. I was just doing my civic duty because I have, I know the individual players. So we go and we went and stopped it. Immediately we stopped it. It turned out that the cabinet of Uganda had actually sat and they gazetted that area as a swamp. The cabinet of Uganda said that's no longer a swamp. So you can use it for anything. Now, what does that mean? Whenever it rains, remember that water first goes into the swamp. The swamp filters it and then it enters the lake. Mm -hmm. If you allow that water to run from the streets of Kampala with oil, with soot from cars, with all the garbage, and you dump it into the lake, you are poisoning the lake. That will kill the flora and fauna in the lake. The fish, even if they do not die, they may get certain uh, poisons and fuel and other uh, chemicals into them that when me and you eat them, we develop in future cancer and stuff like that. This is a, a health risk. But even the water we drink Who is, is from there lake to Victoria? defend the public good? Hmm? Even the water we drink from Lake Victoria. Exactly. So who is there to stand and defend the public good? Against uh, who took this decision to cabinet but, that they but Andrew, that they digazette? Andrew, mm. and this is where uh, the politics. And I want to go into one of your 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 paragraphs again. Just allow me to read it. You say, when political competition was introduced in a society with such a philosophy, meaning you know the 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 one of marketized and with a desperately poor electorate, it made a bad situation worse. Just like public enterprises were sold in capital markets, votes became fair game. Political contests came to resemble financial competition. With a philosophy that glorifies money, voters could only listen to those candidates who had oodles of cash. Hence, people in public office could misappropriate funds and carry their loot to their constituencies to buy votes. Elections became contests over money rather than ideas. The marketization of the economy led to the marketization of politics. Now, for the last, Andrew, for the last, what, let me say, since the beginning of 2023, Actually, yeah, you remember from the time of the Mabati scandal, the media platforms have been debating this endless cycle of theft of public funds. And yet somehow the politicians are able to get away with it and nothing seems to happen. I mean, very recently, the speaker has frustrated the debate of essential motion by uh, Sech Kubo. What does that say about 
the management of our public affairs and what needs to be done. I think we really need to have a conversation about this. So before I go to what needs to be done, let me begin with the, what has gone wrong. You see, I think that the way democratic competition has evolved in Uganda, or let me be very careful, the specific way in which democratic competition has evolved in Uganda mm. has been injurious mm. to the public good. Mm. And that many times, because democracy has been sold to us as a religion, we take it, we have taken it superficially, mm -hmm. without appreciating the context in which this competition takes place. Remember that democracy was a byproduct of development in the developed world. It was not a cause of it. Those countries first um, developed, became industrial uh, countries with large and educated middle classes and uh, 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 urbanized societies before they became democratic. And during that process of industrial transformation, they put in place particular institutions so that democracy it was introduced, the expansion of the franchise was introduced at a point where the vast majority of people were not economically desperate. Remember that when the 1929 uh, depression began and created mass unemployment in Europe, it led to fascism in Germany, in Italy. Democracies collapsed. So democracy always has been successful after the Second World War because it was built on an economically, in an economically successful society, mm. which already had developed both social classes and the political institutions that can harness it into, the, into, into uh, a, a positive public purpose. When you introduce democratic competition unrestrained in a very poor society where voters mm. uh, live in a grassroots hut, perhaps live on one meal a day mm. and things like that, you are likely to get what you are seeing. For all intents and purposes, uh, Robert, mm. you know that if you take democracy at its face value, mm. the Ugandan said in terms of the two elements of democracy, mm. political participation and political contestation, mm. Uganda is much more democratic than Rwanda. Mm. Much, much more democratic in terms of the space for free expression, for political competition, for so many things, mm. Mm. Mm, for the press. But if you go to Rwanda, you find a state that is able to serve the public good, to be highly responsive to the needs of all classes, the elite, the poor, and the rich. It is called a all social contract, Andrew. Exactly. So it is less democratic because the Rwanda, the Rwanda, the RPF has restrained those areas where democratic competition, if you left it unregulated and controlled in a poor country, it can lead you to a genocide. In fact, the genocide in Rwanda was born of unrestrained political contestation, which led to ethnic polarization. So they have been able to restrain contestation in specific areas in order to insulate the state from democratic pressures. For us, we yielded so much competition that if you try to run in border borders, they are voters. You cannot touch them. Because they are voters. Let me give you an example. The World Bank had me and the Goldberg Mushab, and I thought he would be on this, uh, on, 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 on this uh, um, space. I will look for him. They had us to do a study on ENR, Environmental and National Resources Sector of Uganda. We traveled across the country, and these are the things we found in our study. One, that everywhere, without exception, people were encroaching on uh, forest reserves, national parks, wetlands, and other protected areas. Right. In every place where they had encroached, mm. The institutions of government that are mandated to stop them, whether it was UA, NFA, or NEMA, tried to intervene. The people complained to the elected representatives. The elected representative, whether it was an MP, LC3 or LC5, or the president personally, intervened to protect the encroachers because they are voters. Mm. And listen to this, Robert, and this was the most important part of our, our finding. Mm. It did not matter whether the local government was under FDC, UPC, DP, NRM, or under independent. Mm. The definitive factor that shaped the response was that you had an elected official who has the power to decide whether his voters should be evicted or not. And he always chose the harm to the public good in order to protect their private interests of remaining in office and winning the next election. So when I raise these issues, I, that's why in my article I say, I don't think just the exit from seven alone solves the problem. We Ugandans need to, think, need to rethink. How do we restructure our democratic process in such a way that the state is insulated from immediate, such immediate pressures and is allowed to enjoy a degree of autonomy in order to pursue public, uh, yeah. uh, the public good, hmm? but, even if certain sections of voters have to be... Uh, so, yeah. so, which brings me to a point that, uh, you know, I, I, that lately there are things I can't just simply reconcile. So, if these things are bad, all of the corruption things we're talking about, they're not just bad for us, the private citizens, they're even bad for those in public office in the sense that they undermine your ability to be an effective ruler or administrator of this country. So how can it be that when a group of people try to exercise their right or their ability to protest against this very kind of behavior, it's them who are then sent to jail? It is them who are arrested, and then you've got a massive deployment of security forces to protect those 
who are actually accused of this very same behavior of uh, stealing funds and undermining the state's ability to deliver services. How do you square that for a young person who is looking and watching and wondering who, who does the state serve? Does it serve its citizens or is it a privileged group of people? These are the questions that are going on in the public's mind that the state seems to have forgotten about. You're talking about the public good, but it seems to have forgotten about the citizens and instead a small group of people is having a wonderful time. So I will first digress from Uganda and give you another example so that I can return to Uganda and understand the broader context in which I'm speaking. Right. The Carnegie Foundation mm. did a study about India, mm. democracy in India. Mm. And uh, the study was in 2018 or 2017. It's titled, Where, where Theft Pays. Something like mm. that. Where Theft Pays. Mm. They argue that in every election, the share of criminals in the Indian parliament increases by 2% in every election. What do you mean? The share, I'm going to explain to you. There is a guy called Denya. Stephen Denya, he wrote a book called Rogue Elephant, Harnessing the Power of India's Democracy. Mm. He shows that in the 2014 elections, for a parliament of about 600 members, or 630 members, there were 2,100 candidates for 600 seats in parliament. 700 of them had a criminal record. Mm. Of those, 168 had crimes which are called heinous crimes, like rape, murder, extortion, robbery, these high uh, crimes. And rather, not, not, I think, of the 700 who contested for seats of parliament mm. with the, these heinous crimes, 168 won elections to the parliament, of whom 33 were elected while in jail. Okay. Well, in jail. So, and he got the Kariki Foundation, uh, Endowment, uh, Foundation rather, in their study. Therefore, they went to explain what is the reason that has led India to this sad state, where democracy has taken, has tended increasingly to empower criminals, increase the share of criminals in public service, in public office, mm. in political office, mm. and eliminated high spirited individuals. Mm. So, Uganda, we should understand that Uganda is not just an island. You can find it in Ghana, I just came from Ghana, you can find it in Kenya, you can find it in Zambia, you can find it in Malawi, as countries in Senegal, you find these problems. Poor countries that democracy is facing these problems. Now, how do I answer the young person out there? I think that Museven has created an equilibrium, but I think the equilibrium is beginning to fail because the level of dysfunction is reaching too far. The equilibrium has been yeah. that you, Robert Kamshenka, mm. A border border rider, mm. you can go through red lights, you can ride, ride on the right side of the road. Mm. You, Andrew Mwenda, you can build in a swamp. Mm. You, send Kashirinji, mm. you can take over the a, a forest reserve mm. and take the land there. Mm. If you are Ivan Okuda, you can go and do your own impunity. Mm. If you are David Impang in public office, you can steal as you wish. Mm. If you are Peter Mwesige, each one of us in our own sphere, if you are Peter Mwesige, you, have, you can run rushed over everybody in traffic. Mm. Each one of us has been given a freedom to all, exercise our impunity. Although, to be fair, now, all, the individuals in, have, in exchange, all, all the individuals you have mentioned are not the kind, so would we behave like that? I'm just mentioning them because I'm reading them on my screen. I'm using them as examples. Right, yeah. so, so, so when you see that now, in exchange, we shall also leave him to be emperor of Uganda. And we want to disturb him. And I think in many ways, Museveni has created that equilibrium where there is a, 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 a contract, a social contract, a political contract between us, mm. uh, the population, and him, that in exchange for the impunity he has given us, you know, our freedom has become license mm. or chaos. Mm. So in exchange for that, we will leave him in his job alone, mm. which means that if you are isolated groups of the Kabushengas and the, uh, and the Raymond Mujunis and the Fono Pondos, and you are trying to destabilize this equilibrium, then he will have the army and the police, which are the core institutions of state, with the effective coercive apparatus, he will get even with you. Mm. And I think that we have tolerated this system because many of us are beneficiaries of it. Mm. It's impunity, it's chaos, mm. it benefits so many social groups. Mm. That is why when anyone tries to reign in border borders, he will intervene and protect border borders. If you try to reign in people who are on public land, he will protect them. So, but as he has grown older, his ability to manage this chaos he has unleashed to exercise direct effective control on a daily basis to ensure that it, does not run out, it doesn't run out of control mm. is diminishing significantly and that is why we are reaching crisis levels in governance and so andrew i mean i i, I just want to so let me let me let me let me divert a bit and i'm going to put you yourself personally on the on the on the spot here mm. so andrew you you have very high level access and i mean you're not just a pri ordinary private citizen i mean you 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 go up to the high you go up to state house you make president one of the things that you know somebody raised it with me and i said good point i said i promise to raise it with you you're one of the people that has benefited from taking people to him investors and all these kinds of people so was there a time or has that process ever served a good public purpose well i, I should tell you i do not remember a single investor i took there mm. who needed the public money or who do not meet his side of the bargain. That is one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I practically every public official I have uh, uh, to give credit to Museveni, this is where I find that, you know, as human beings, we have many faces. Because 
when I have gone to President Museveni mm. to defend the public official whom they want to run out of office or recommend someone to be appointed in a strategic place mm. and given him good reason, mm. he has always actually accepted it. In which case, I am I would be unfair to say that he always chooses incompetent people because mm. when I have gone and argued the case for competent people, there are many persons, there are not many, but a couple of people holding strategic positions in the government today mm. where I went, where there were, uh, people were trying to fight them to get out of office or were trying to block them from being appointed. I went and explained to him, he took the right decision. Right. In many other things where I have worked with him, whether it's in Rwanda and elsewhere, I have found him much more open to advice, especially when you give it back with good facts and a good logic analysis. Right. I remember there's someone I took him where he said, you know, I, my son here, Mwende, is mad, but I like him because he brings me, when he comes to recommend something, he has his facts right, he has his figures correct, and he has argument well outlined. Mm. So, to that degree, at a personal level, I can give him, I can give him credit. Mm -hmm. I would be the, uh, I would be unfair to him if I do not defend him in my personal experience. Mm. But uh, Robert, there are many appointments I see these days. Like there's somebody they appointed recently to head and corruption in U U URA. Turns out he had been a convicted felon for having stolen money, or uh, rather tried to defraud URA of taxes or things like that. I see mm. uh, Minister of ICT appointed. She cannot tell you what AI means. I mean, you wonder what exactly was the calculation here? You have your central bank. You don't have a governor for the last two years. You see, so and yet I am here uh, without a job for uh, the last year. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so Robert, because of this, it is difficult for me. Therefore, my personal experience would have led me to believe otherwise. But I don't know. Uh, somebody should mention that Mwenda brought so and so uh, investor, and uh, he made the best of things. Because I've, I've never taken anybody there who wants public money. Hmm? Even where, by the way, the president has disagreed with me. Mm. He has called me and explained to me, said, "No, no, no, you had convinced me about this, but I think this is the counter argument." And I, really, I have a certain admiration of him when I defend him sometimes in public. People say he has bribed me. Of course, he has bribed me. If a president treats you like that, like me, who is always criticizing him, and he invites you to his house for dinner and you sleep in it, you must consider this man to be a person of exceptional patience, uh, exceptional character. Because if I were a seven, I don't think I would have tolerated Andrew Mwenda. Now, Andrew, I, I want to take you straight back to another issue where I think you could uh, shed a bit more light. And I'm going to read another paragraph from your column, uh, which appeared in The Independent. And I, I shared it with people as part of publicity for this uh, space. You say, this system was not dangerously destructive since Museveni held sway over the core elements of the state. With incredible skill and tenacity, the fiddle, he fiddled with, he managed manipulated and controlled the chaos his economic and political reforms had unleashed. In some cases, he had cajoled, in others, he bribed, while in many, he intimidated and coerced obedience. But he has aged. His ability to retain control over this chaos has significantly diminished. This is because multiple centers of power had proliferated and are vying for influence. Because power is now highly personalized, the struggle for influence has retreated to state house, inevitably setting off family feuds. That's where I want you to shed more light in light of some of the public exchanges that have taken place between his family members but especially the for me the issue that should concern ugandans is that a system that depended on highly personalized power the person who holds that power has diminished ability to exercise it where are we so exactly where we are i have explained in the article i could only repeat what you have just read <laughs> that because you see power is personalized centralized in the presidency personalized in his hands for anyone to exercise influence they need to go to a family member but that therefore means you are setting off family members against each other. Because assuming uh, Andrew Mwenda, the son of the president, took a particular investor in a particular field, and uh, Peter Mwesigi also brought another, mm. and Mwenda are all his sons. So the conflict would have to be unleashed at a family level. It, uh, that is one. The second thing, of course, is in the context of um, family members, I just don't mean simply his children. Mm. Because you should know that a person like a... Uh, General Mosley, I do not think that he's a kind of person who gets involved in investment things. Mm. I do not know any, whether anybody can quote a case where Mohozi was fronting an investor, fronting a business, or getting involved in a business. He doesn't. Mm. Uh, and uh, the little he has gotten involved with with uh, Uganda outside of the military. I can't even remember. He's keen mm. to avoid going outside of his space, which is security, military and security affairs, and to his very purpose not to get entangled in business deals with the wheeler dealers in Kampala. He doesn't. That you can defend him. But Andrew, in light, I mean, you're, you're very close to him. You're actually part of the, the Patriotic League of Uganda. Oh, how, how can he contribute? Or what are his thoughts? Because as you have described, we're in a mess. And you have said that we have to go think about a change that protects the state, that part of Museveni alone will not be enough. So what, what is the thought process? You know, I should tell the listeners, when we were young, Robert Kavhenga, Kiwanuka Kiriowa, Simon Kaiheru, me and General Mohozi, we had a, dis we, we had a discussion group. Hmm? 
So we used to meet and indulge in promiscuous intellectual intercourse. I think we should reestablish that discussion group uh, with him, uh, Robert, so, so that we can discuss things and hear his views. But let me put this way. Yeah. For me, I think mm. that uh, Ugandans, uh, I want to talk about this Mohosi project. I saw my grandson Hashim Malango mm. saying, I don't talk about the worst scheme of all the Mohosi project. Mm-hmm. The Mohosi project was never started by Mohosi, and people may not believe this. That's, that's, that's the fact. That uh, I think Ugandans have come to a conclusion that it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to remove Museveni. Efforts by Bethesda, Bobby Wine have failed in large part because Museveni has effective personal control over the core elements of the state, whether it's coercion or bribery. He's so good at it. So, so he can, he can go get the money and he can get the armies to contain you. And because of those, and also they themselves have not articulated a vision of Uganda that people can buy into. Yes, they have told us what is wrong. They haven't told us what they want to do. We know what they stand against. We don't know what they stand for. And because people, and this is my suspicion, because people don't think that Museveni can be removed, and yet they want a transition, including Museveni's own supporters, people started running around Mohosi. Since he's young, they, they feel he can breathe fresh ideas into what is increasingly becoming a maribund state. Mm. So that is how the Mohosi project started. Mm. He has given it least support because if Mohosi were to get directly involved in trying to promote his own presidency, mm. whether to raise money from the business community here and abroad mm. or to rally people across the country or create a team who can generate ideas for the future of this country, of course it would be very far. But he's been very reluctant to step outside of his military and security sphere to enter the muddy waters of politics. Mm. And he has only done it tactically Occasionally, uh, let me say, in an episode of way, in an episode way, but not as a systemic project that he's pursuing. So there is a problem. And when we met in the Central Committee, I did explain to him this and to my colleagues. You see, if you are a son of the president and uh, you have uh, you have uh, a brother of the president who is your deputy, you have uh, uh, a son of the president who sits on your Central Committee, already you are people from a position of power and privilege. What it does is that you are likely to have very many um, opportunistic individuals without any commitment to your political objectives rushing to join this movement because they know it is associated with power in order to benefit from it, even though they, have, they are looking for a quick payoff rather than having, being investors in the political project you are pursuing. Mm-hmm. It puts the MK project and PLU at a significant disadvantage, that structure of incentives. Let's look at you joining uh, NUP, of which I am the president. And the we, are, Bob Wayne stole my we, are, we are not going to go down that road because you lost. <laughs> so please. <laughs> no, they rigged me that's out. Okay. They did not that. That's, also part, that's also part of our political culture. It's just as well they rigged you out. Let's, let's continue. So they rigged me out. They were also rigged out at the end. Anyway, just aside, if you are to join Noob, there is no money there, Robert. Mm. Right? Mm. What is there? You will be burnt by the sun, beaten by the rain, tear gassed by the police. Mm. The costs are very high. So for you to go to Noob and stick there, you need to be a high commitment individual who is committed to the political project of Noob. Mm. If you are an opportunity looking for a quick payoff, you are likely to go there because the immediate costs are very high where well, the benefits will come at a later date and therefore they are uncertain. <laughs> but the costs are immediate and, uh, 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 and risk and costly. Right? So... So you, you are likely to have many people who say Snoop don't understand, rather who could say PLU don't understand that it in and of itself, it faces an existential challenge that how do you ensure that you have high-spirited, public-spirited individuals who are investors willing to commit to the political objectives. And we, we agreed in, this, in the Central Committee meeting said that we should as much as possible insist that when we get people, they should come as volunteers and that we should ask our members to raise money for the organization so that we see whether they're willing to sacrifice your earnings for the good of the organization. Otherwise, how do we tell? The NRM was successful in the bush because if you went to lower Robert, it was not clear that they would win. Mm. There was no salary. There was no food. There was no accommodation. There was nothing. So you have to be a high, a high commitment individual to stay there. So that is why they had a, a, a correct selection process. But, but Congo has failed to have serious movements because you can be in a double movement, capture a gold mine or a diamond mine, mine it, sell it, make a lot of money, even without capturing power in Kinshasa. So it's difficult for Congo to develop ideologically anchored movement. But, uh, but, ideologically but, but anchored you know, movement. Andrew, and I don't want us to spend mm. too much time on this. I mean, already your organization is at a disadvantage because it has a powerful position. So it will be very difficult for you to get highly convicted individuals to come in because it's just the nature of what it is. But... This, that, that's my point. So that's my point. But Andrew, I want us to go back to where. By the way, Robert, let's, sorry to interrupt you. Even if high commitment individuals, the organization were to come in, they are likely to be crowded out by opportunistic individuals because for them they have much vigor and energy and zest. They have something to gain immediately. They may not look at the long term you're trying to pursue at the short term. So that is the structure of incentives that faces PLU. Of course, I would, I, I would prefer myself that the general host becomes more actively involved in trying to promote his presidency because I'm dealing with a risk situation. I don't see a situation in which 
First of all, I don't even think that Bobby Wayne measures up to be president of Uganda. We are going to be discussing tomorrow the future economy of the world in artificial intelligence, in quantum computing, in robotics, in synthetic biology. If I look at the well, loop, uh, who are the people there Andrew, to, be, to form uh, Andrew, the let's, brain trust Andrew, of let's, these ideas? Andrew, let's not go down that road because even on this side, you, you have your own people who are also have their limitations. So, which is why for me, <laughs> the debate, I mean, you saw the AI committee that was set up by UCC, but let's not go down that road. Mm. But my point is, mm. Is it possible? That and I saw it. The youngest person on it was 155 years. <laughs> the best illustration of it was given by one of X's most, I mean, the guy is such a humorist, a guy called Fahad. You should check his, his, his depiction of that. But I want to go back, Andrew, to two paragraphs, because I think sometimes we also spend a disproportionate amount of time on individuals and we lose sight of what our interests should be. And I just want to read a paragraph again. You said, you said, this is, the tragedy of Uganda. That's after the last paragraph. The country has lost all sense of the nation with distinct interests independent of Museveni's. For instance, the interests of Uganda are best served by a functioning city. This is critical because the most skilled citizens with high productivity levels live and work in Kampala and its surrounding Wakiso district. You could add Mukono. This area produces 65% of the GDP and 75% of the tax revenues. Visitors, be they investors and tourists, First, enter Kampala before visiting other areas. The impression one gets of the country is when they get into the, its capital city. I want to go back to that question you raised. How do we regain our sense of the nation with distinct interests? I am, I am, I'm in a group where a very interesting document uh, is being discussed. It's being circulated, it's being discussed. I'll share it with you, Andrew. But in there, it captures what really should be our interests. And I'll quote from it a little bit. What do you see? How do we get back to what our, and what should our interests be? I personally think that the beginning point of reforming Uganda has to be the political level, that we need to undermine, to restructure our political competition, end this uh, uh, winner-take-all form of government, create a, a constitution that allows for a government of national unity, so that everyone who contests will partake in the government. I have a belief that in some way, if we go into an election and we have proportional representation in the parliament and even in the cabinet, and we agree to work together that way, it will reduce political polarization, reduce the incentives for people to buy votes. And therefore, once you form a government of national unity, it is possible to have a conversation about the national project than when you have a contest between us and them. We need to end the politics of winner take all. We need to amend our constitution and create a politics of a win win politics, not a win lose politics. Okay, Andrew. So let me put to you I mean, I'm sure you'll recall, you know. And thanks for referring to our political discussion group. Uh, you forgot to say that a lot of it took place in my flat, and at the end of which, in Bogolo, exactly, at the end of which we would put on uh, tabulero sheruz muzina and dance. But I just wanted to point out to you that since then, um, actually, the document that I was talking about, there's some things I want to quote from it. Okay, very quickly, and I'll, I'll share it with you, uh, and I'll just talk to my colleagues and just see if I can circulate it. One of the statements made there is, "We have certainly not been growing fast." or sustainably enough in our economy since 2011. It therefore, Andrew, it therefore means that one of the things we should actually be discussing is whether this economy is being managed in a way that can sustain and work for the citizens of this country. Because even if you organize the politics and move away from winner take all and go back to the movement system, what are you coalescing around? Because the movement system coalesced around a minimum program of recovery and rehabilitation and, re and generating growth. What should be at the center of this of, of the politics? Should it be how politicians share the resources or how this country grows? I think the second one. First of all, Robert, the movement system was never a movement system. It was actually a, a disgraced one-party state, and that's why it failed. NRM did not exercise good faith when they talked about the movement system because we went into elections and M7 said we have won. So if we are all in the movement, how have you won? It was very clear that this was not a movement system. It may have been an individual. It was not even an individual merit system. It was a system, a one-party system, disguised. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what I could say is that a government of a national would require that all parties are free to contest. Mm -hmm. Once all parties have uh, contested, then they share cabinet on the strength of the uh, on the basis of the electoral strength. The second thing, uh, Robert, Uganda cannot grow. Uh, uh, well, let me begin with Kampala City. As I have written in that article, Kampala has the most productive citizens. By productive, I mean, by productivity, I mean output per unit labor input. If you go to Kanyandahi, the a peasant who pu puts in eight hours of work is likely to produce a value of not more than 5,000 shillings. A skilled Ugandan in Kampala who puts in a full eight hours of work is likely to produce maybe $1,000 worth of value. So that is what makes economies dynamic, that you touch those areas where you have high levels of productivity of factors of production. Productivity referring to output per unit factor input, whether it's a piece of land, whether it's a piece of, whether it's a, a unit of capital or a unit of labor. Kampala 
is the most productive. Now, you imagine that the most productive citizens of Uganda are held in jam two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. When they are not in the jam, uh, in office, they are already stressed because they were delayed in the jam. To have a highly productive skilled person produced to the, optim- to the optimum capacity, you need to create the right environment for them. Imagine you're driving through potholes, through garbage, through crackers. Your car shock absorbers are broken. If you go leave it in the garage, they will steal, the, they will steal your parts. So you have to fit in the garage to supervise it being repaired. I mean, so you have literally grabbed the entire quality of your highly skilled citizens, stuck them in the jams, in garages, in stress in office, and their productivity is very low. Even before we fix everything was in girls. You just need to have your productive citizens work in the right environment, live in the right environment. This city looks like a garbage dump. During a NAM, non Island conference, and during a, the G77, 88 presidents confirmed coming. At the end of the day, only 28 showed up. Why did 60 abscond? They sent advanced teams which entered the city that was a disaster zone. Drainage, flooding, garbage, potholes, border borders, they recommended to their home officers, look, this, this place here is not conducive for you to come. It's not secure for you. It's not good for you. So, the low attendance of NAM was evidence of the, the, was a, the cost of a very, very poor management of the city. On the country's image, you have 60 presidents cancelling attendance who had confirmed. I hope somebody in the state house and elsewhere have learned this. Andrew. How, how can, the other day, President Kagame was being sworn in. He had 27 presidents attending swearing in. The same number of presidents who attended NAM. NAM has 143 members. Africa has only 54 members of whom 27 were able to show for his attendance. Because 20 percent advanced teams, they find the status functioning, things are working. And I'm sorry to raise the question of Rwanda. I know it raises a lot of uh, problems for you in Uganda. Here, let's let's go to Botswana and about... Namibia. <laughs> no, but Andrew, so, I wanted to read another paragraph from you and then one from the document I've talked about. You say mm-hmm. Museveni and most of his family members have little contact with the city. It's restaurants, streets, bars, nightclubs, etc. Besides, the president's bread, in brackets, votes, is buttered from rural constituencies. The city is seen as a scene of resistance to his rule, so the government has starved it of funding. Last financial year, KCCA was allocated 40 billion shillings for infrastructure, roads, drainage, schools, markets, health centers, etc. against a national road infrastructure budget of 4 trillion. Basically, the source of 65% of our GDP, 75% of our revenues, got less than 1% of the road budget. How is this possible? Well, because all decisions are made by one old man who has grown impervious to the crisis in the city. You have, uh, do I, do I didn't add anything there, Robert? You can, uh, as we used to say in the <laughs> monitor newsroom, you can expo on... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Elucidate, Father. Yes. Yes, because I should tell you, Robert, I have had an opportunity, and this is very bad again for me to do. I'm sure the prince will not allow me to set house again, because I've been to set house and I've argued this issue of KCCA. Yeah. That point I have made there. And uh, one time I went with the Director General of the Africa, uh, the, uh, uh, something called the French Development Agency, which is the agency AFD. for development, AF, AFD. At that time, they, had, they were giving us a very concessionary loan of 0.5% of a period of 40 years, 10-year growth period, and they wanted to build uh, 30,000 street lights across Kampala, but also do pedestrian sidewalks, because most people in Kampala actually walk to work. So... I was telling the president with these people, the president said, look, we have other priorities and this, we can't borrow money for this. But he said, Mr. President, first of all, most of the citizens in Kampala walk. It's, and many of them walk at night. It's important for them at least to have lighting. So this is a loan with a 10-year growth period. Even if you take it now, you have 10 years before it even becomes a problem of debt service. Because at that time, I should tell you, Uganda was borrowing from Kenya, from loan sharks in Kenya. Government of Uganda. You know, Robert, next year Uganda is going to default on its debt because we have $1.5 billion to pay next year. Where are we going to get our 1.5 billion? Because in 2020, 2021, we borrowed short-term loans, some of them from loan sharks at high interest rates with very short maturity periods of three, four years or five years. Now they are maturing. The only way we can pay them is by depleting our foreign exchange reserves. Our foreign exchange reserves have already been depleted partially from uh, four months to around three. Now they're going to fall to about two months or one and a half, uh, rather, yeah, to one and a half months. Six weeks. I saw the president, yeah, okay, yeah, the other day, I saw the president even uh, criticizing the governor of the central bank, saying uh, foreign exchange reserves. We don't need foreign exchange reserves. What? Hey, but, yes, we didn't see it. Was He was uh, in Kenya giving a speech and said he does not agree uh, with the, with these issues of foreign exchange reserves. Some, so, somebody told me, by the way, that China, mm-hmm. today, China has $3.5 mm-hmm. trillion dollars in reserves. China. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. But what I mean, all countries keep huge reserves in order to cushion yourself against any shock so that you can now use your reserves, you know, to import if you couldn't export things. Mm. But anyway, so the president doesn't believe, I saw him give a speech in Kenya, openly he said he doesn't believe in those things of reserves, that the government of the central bank should stop wasting his time telling him about the uh, depletion of reserves. <laughs> 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 so, so, so you can see where, uh, where we are. Hmm? 
So, 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 no. so here we come back to the city of Kampala. And, and, the and city the of Kampala, the, the fact that these guys are out of touch, that's the fact of the matter. I mean, if you, yes. if you whiz through Kampala with escorts and blinded screens, you'll never know how people live. Yes, yeah, so we have met the president a couple of times, and you know, many people have raised issues that the city is in a dire state, and uh, he seems impervious to this crisis. And for me, it's disappointing because more than any human being in the world, I would imagine that President Seven would be the first human being to know that the city, the city is your center of gravity in terms of your economy. It's the most dynamic place you need to invest in because it's like the heart of the country. If your heart is clogged with the cholesterol, it does not matter how many of your different arteries mm. hmm, uh, really are working well. Mm. If the heart cannot pump blood to the brain to other parts of the body, the body will, of course, to collapse. Finally fight. Mm. And Uganda is facing such an existential crisis that if you can't invest a lot of money in infrastructure in Kampala, uh, solve these problems of Kitesi, problems of drainage, you are just eroding the very foundation. You are killing the, go the goose that is supposed to lead the golden, to lay the golden egg of development or growth. And Andrew, I want to stay with that issue of growth and development. So we've got 70% of our population is under the age of 30. This economy is not growing and if there's any indication of the state of the economy it's what we're talking about in Kampala this whole dysfunction and failure this economy is not creating jobs for young people there is no opportunity <coughs> what's going to happen I don't know <laughs> I don't know how we are going to handle the explosion of youth which is already a problem because if a person like you has a red political economy the first stage of your development is to create large-scale blue-collar jobs for the less skilled. Exactly. And you do that largely through manufacturing. Yeah. I don't see I, any I will, I, I disagree, in but I will explain. You first finish and I'll give you another argument. Okay. I do not see any investment or funds, whether the equity funds, venture capital funds, or uh, uh, loans that are being set aside funds in the bank to finance uh, manufacturing. What I see is something called the partial development model, whereby we say we have sent more than $2 trillion now to peasants in villages are expecting that every peasant on a piece of land is a shop entrepreneur. I don't believe that. From my own study of economic history is that uh, first, to modernize an economy, you need to separate the peasant from land, and that's what has happened in practical every economy, and then the farmer or the peasant gets related to the same land through the initiative or agency of capital as an agricultural proletariat. How does that create a market? Because the first thing I, th I think that the president, whenever I see him speaking, he thinks that the market is the number of human beings, the number of souls, yet the market is purchasing power. If I get Kavshenga out of Kanunga and bring him to Kampala, mm. he has to pay rent, he has to buy food, he has to buy fuel. He has, practically, he can only sell his labor power in exchange for money, then he goes to the market and get, make, gets his needs. But when I have Chiam Lesiri on his land in Kanyandahi, he lives in his own house, mm -hmm. he gets firewood from the nearby mm -hmm. forest, he eats from his own garden. Mm -hmm. Practically, his relationship with the market is so marginal only to buy once in a while. So Panado. Uh -huh, something like uh -huh. that. So how do you monetize an economy where every person is with 60% of Uganda's population, 69%, 69.4, are subsistence farmers, meaning that they are hand-to-mouth farmers. Their relationship with the market is so small. So how, therefore, do you create a dynamic market when everybody is self-employed? You know, the share of self-employed in the United States population is 7%. In Uganda, I think it is 80%. You can measure the poverty of your country by the share of the population that is self-employed. Because every person in Uganda is on the piece of land. Andrew, so, yeah, go on. Okay. You, you conclude, then I'll give you. I say the other problem of Uganda is that the, the drivers of growth in Uganda has largely been services. Uh, telecommunications, whatever you say. The problem with the growth, in, uh, growth driven by services is, one, services are not very good at giving you what we call productivity gains. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Productivity gains, because let's imagine, let me give you an example of a service called a border border. Hmm? Mm. You can increase the productivity of a border border by increasing speed, which may lead to an accident. You can increase the productivity of a teacher either by enlarging the class or increasing the time he has to teach, which both of which may lead to poor uh, quality teaching. You cannot increase the productivity of a surgeon because if he has to operate on so many people, he may, their productivity growth in services is limited because you cannot achieve Increase productivity at the price of reducing the quality of the service, even for a waitress in a restaurant. So, but when you go into areas like manufacturing, there are unlimited pro productivity gains you can get because of scaling technology. And that is why I favor the fact that we need to begin with low quality manufacturing, which can lead us to high quality manufacturing. You know, the Chinese started with poor quality products. Now they're beginning to enter high quality uh, manufacturing items. But, you can begin but, with the capability but, 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 and end up with an Andrew, iPhone. Andrew, I, I understand mm. that and it makes sense. But I can, here, now let me move away from my position as uh, asking the questions and give you also what I think. You see... I, I, I respect your political economy. Let me say, <laughs> look, one country that managed to move itself into middle income status is Thailand. And Thailand did so by simply revolutionizing its rice growing. And by doing that, was able to export, generate capital, and then became the outsource capital or the outsource de destination 
for manufacturing car parts. But it came after Vietnam has ridden the coffee boom into industrialization. What we have done, the one sector which is productive, and that is agriculture, in which we have a competitive advantage, has been completely neglected. There's just no money in that ministry. They only pay salaries, occasional crisis management, end of story. Andrew, the coffee sector employs 12 million Ugandans. Are you aware of that? No. And yet, yeah, and yet, when we went to argue about this question of coffee and were presenting the issue of where the state should invest, my argument was the state should invest in improving productivity. At that level, you increase the incomes of people at that level and ability to employ more people at that level. People are talking about setting up factories. How many people can that hopeless factory in Ntungamu employ? In Ntungamu, how many? Mm. And yet, mm. coffee farms, if they are productive, I can tell you, Andrew, at the height of my harvest period, I employ 100 people every day. Mm. If you mm. have, as we know, there are 1 million coffee households. If each one was employing 100 people, how many would that be? 100 million. So my issue is very simple. If you look at the different agricultural sectors, the people who actually work in there, there are laborers actually. The sector actually employs laborers. So my argument, therefore, to you is... The, so Robert, me and you have actually arrived at the same point. No, my, my point is that this manufacturing mm. argument is being used as an argument not to invest in agriculture and to walk away from that obligation. Because, okay, you set up a factory in Amman that employs 50,000 people. What happens to the how many millions of youth who have no jobs, who are just riding? No, on? Robert, yeah, I have listened to you carefully, but I think <clears throat> yeah. you have built a Chinese wall between agriculture and manufacturing. In fact, I think that the two go together. Right. Because a country like Uganda, which is well endowed in agriculture, one, you need to invest. I, I told you I started by saying that the transformation will begin in agriculture by separating peasants from land so that you open that land for commercial production. The peasants can be reunited the same land through the initiative of capital. That is your example that you employ a hundred people. I don't think that every peasant there can do the things you do, uh, uh, Robert. No, the peasants the things you employ do their family require members. a level of Yes, the, the things you do, whether it is technological innovation, whether we can say it is to use improved seed that is fast maturing and high yielding, whether to use fertilizer, whether to use irrigation, whether to use pesticides, all these things are likely to be employed by you than any other ordinary peasant. It would be an exceptional peasant to go into that kind of commercial agriculture. But assuming we have to increase large volumes of agricultural output, where would we put it? Because if you sell it at the way it is, you fetch very little from international markets. Maybe you get 2%. But if it's when you process that agriculture, so agriculture and manufacturing are self-reinforcing, that you must invest in agriculture and the products of agriculture. If it's milk, you must be able to produce cheese, butter, powder milk, and other things. If it is coffee, you must be able to build value within coffee. So because industry does not stand alone, it must have forward and backward linkages with the rest of the economy. In which case, investment in agriculture can only be successful if you have investment in manufacturing so that you convert what you're producing in agriculture into industrial products. Remember, Robert, that the Development takes place in the context of international trade. And international trade is a hierarchy or a value chain. Some countries will produce cotton, others with cloth, others market high fashion. Some countries will mine iron ore, others make steel, others sell automobiles. How much you earn depends on your position in that value chain. If you so, produce cotton or coffee, you earn about 2% or 3%. If you weave cloth, maybe you're likely to earn 20%. But if you market high fashion, you're Dolce, Dolce & Gabbana, you are... Uh, Louis Vuitton, you will earn about 60-70% of the international market price. The process of development is upgrading from these low-value products to high-value products. So if you produce coffee Andrew. and not process it, if, hold a second, if you produce your cotton and don't have a manufacturing sector, you will, we, Uganda has been exporting raw cotton for the last 100 years. That's why, that is why we are a highly indebted poor country. 120 years. If we move into cloth, we will add more value. Let me give you an example. In 2019, Uganda produced 200,000 bales of cotton. We sold abroad, we exported 190. The, the 10,000 that remained, we made it into cloth. From the ones we made it into cloth, we earned $50 million. From the one we exported, we also made $50 million. Essentially, 10,000 uh, bales of cotton turned into cloth uh, uh, earned the same money as 190,000. So I agree with you, Robert. One, we need to boost our culture so that it creates the foundation for our manufacturing. The idea is that we must add value to our products so that we can earn better prices in international uh, markets. Andrew, let me, let, me, let me just give you a very simple example, and then I'll come back to this issue. We couldn't supply potatoes to KFC because we just don't grow the right potatoes. Why can't we just sort out yes. our production process to meet the standards of the market? We face the same problem in coffee. Yes. So even if you set up a local processing, whatever, to manufacture a final product, you still need very good inputs into that process. So you have to fix the production process in agriculture. Not only will it create better yes. jobs, it will create better income for you. Other countries have figured it. But Andrew, I, I want to come back there to the, one of the things that we don't seem to fix, even if we go into manufacturing and industrialization. We are now neglecting key elements. One, how are we training these young people for suitability in the job market? You've seen what's happened in the education sector. You see what's happening in the health sector. So that our human capital needs to be invested. But most importantly, Andrew, we are a landlocked country. From 
near to Mombasa to the port is very costly, even at the port before you get the world market. The Dutch will export way cheaper than you from here to America. So how do we reorganize the politics, Andrew? Because you said, we, you know, away from winner takes all. But how do you bring the politics back to discussing these things, the jobs for young people, the allocation of resources to things that work? We've just been treated to skipping iron sheets, to people sharing out what they call them, honorarium payments, and people are traveling to go visit religious establishments at the cost of government for private prayers. I mean, Andrew, how can the politics, how can just fixing no winner take all return people to focusing on what's good for the country? You know, I've been discussing this issue of ending winner take all politics and introducing the idea of a national intergovernment after an election with Conrad in Kutu. Mm. And uh, we may be misguided, but have, we have this belief that, you see, when all of us have to work together, it is easy to bring this kind of discussion in a cabinet, in the national forum, when all of us are working together. But when all of us are working against each other, it is uh, who wins the day. It is difficult to have to focus on a national debate. I'll give you an example of the United States. When Obama ran in 2008, he campaigned on the platform that America's infrastructure is badly run down and we, they need to invest in infrastructure. When he came to power, the, the Republicans accused him of promoting socialism. And when they took control of Congress, they frustrated him throughout the eight years. Trump ran saying the same thing, saying, you know, if you fly from Dubai to JFK, it is like flying from a, a first world country to a third world country. He kept saying America's infrastructure is like that of a third world country. Immediately they came to power, the Democrats opposed him. They had supported Obama, now they opposed Trump. I get the sense that when you have first polarized the politics, a country is so difficult to do anything because the aim is to make the other person fail. That is the way winner take all politics works. But if you arrange a government of national unity, Bethesda is there, Bob Wayne is there, Kavshenga is there, Mohoz is there, and we hit around the table, it is possible to bring this conversation because we are in all, all of us are in it together. But Andrew, and that is my hope. Andrew, I don't know whether it can work. Andrew, mm. the fact of accommodating mm. individuals has demonstrated that just accommodating individuals simply to sit at the table can just become a dinner party. And they, once they eat, they won't care. But let me just read to you from that document and which quoted an Afrobarometer survey report, which said the problems that the youth believe must be addressed in the following priority are one, health, two, water supply and sanitation, three, education, four, infrastructure, five, unemployment, six, corruption. Is it possible to structure the politics and say, okay, we're all coming together, but we're coming together to deal with these six points because 70% of this country wants these issues solved? The only problem I see is that every time the public wants these issues discussed, they are dismissed. And in fact, I mean, the president went to Bukedea and praised the speaker for the investment in a sports facility, which definitely was built using public funds. How do you square that? Mm. In, you know, these are the things that are bothering people. And then you tell in terms who are supposed to be providing, who are the main backbone of your health system in the country that they should pay to be able to provide. <laughs> Hello? How do, Robert, you, your voice had disappeared. Sorry, I was saying. <laughs> you, 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 how do you square that? Square all of this profligacy, the, the waste, with telling interns that they need to pay for the privilege of working as interns in government hospitals. Yet they are desperately needed for help. You say all teachers mm. to teach must get a degree. So now you're going to hobble the education system. And you've talked mm. about the investment in infrastructure and all of these things. So the, the thing is, there's that mismatch between the contradictions in the political establishment, the mismatch between their interests and those of the public. How can... Those well, I think that... Uh, I don't know whether I believe that his advanced age, President Seven is likely to, to launch a large, a grand reform project away from the dysfunctions we see. Mm. We have to wait when he retires or, or expires, and then you, you, the new person will come and try to promote uh, a focus strategy. I really don't know how that happens, because... It is possible that by some good luck, a new government can come in with a new leader whom we have underestimated. Maybe he comes with the new energy and zest. But, Robert, you know, when you've been in power for 40 years, the job becomes so routine. In any case, Seven has one great advantage, strategic patience. But now his patience has become a big cost to the country because... No, apart from uh, that, Andrew, the other problem mm. with his strategic patience is that he's running out of runway. He's 80. So exactly. So, uh -huh. so that's his time has also run yeah. out. And I don't think a person at 80 can unleash new energy because we, he's we a Biden. biological clock. Yes, his biological clock is ticking every day. And, and in the event that a, a democratic process or any other process cannot, uh, NRM cannot produce an alternative to him who is young, much more energetic, with new ideas, and maybe he's trying to frame the solution. But I think that the first thing is either we have to wait for him to exit 
uh, by whatever means, and then we hope that another person who comes in does not replicate the system. Remember, Robert, me, I'm very careful. I know that the people always think that change in and of itself is good. You saw they removed the Gaddafi and the, the end of one bad system may not necessarily lead to a better one. You know, if you say that all change is good, you remove Gaddafi, now you have a collapsed state, or you can remove uh, Mobutu and things never even get together ever again, because Mobutu was certainly such a uh, 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 you think he was a very bad leader. So, I don't know, really. But you can hope that when there is change of government and a new and young president comes, he has the skills to do three things that I'm, I feel seven has done. Well, let me say two things. Keep stabilize the political dispensation that you do not have instability. The other is you sustain uh, a certain degree of economic growth. Although Uganda's growth has declined, even when you look over the last 10 years, hmm, it is above the African average, actually. So, sustain growth, su sustain stability. Stability first, growth second. And then he can add on new innovations, both in the politics and in focusing the state, hmm, mm -hmm. and in focusing the state on the kind of development projects Ugandans are looking at. But another thing, Robert, what Uganda needs to address is the public ethic in public service. We need to have a discussion of what is the Uganda we want and how are we mobilized to that future that we are looking so, at. So, right now, right now, every, it is every man for himself. It is the uh, Banyankore, I think, called Kushakura. Everybody's there to grab, to loot, and just enrich themselves. As roads fall apart, as hospitals decline, as schools can't function, everybody's enriching themselves. Andrew, I, I want to pick on from where you just left off a few minutes ago, which is construction of, I mean, a discussion, not a construction, a discussion Let's assume we are back in my flat in 1998 in, in Bugolobi, and we are having a conversation about the future. And this future, I think it now makes sense for us to, talk, to start talking about a post Museveni Uganda. Mm. Let's assume it's over now. He's not there anymore. What would a post Museveni Uganda, what are the things and challenges that you see will face the guy who is sitting in office, by whatever manner in which he arrives in that office, hopefully he's still intact and is there. What are the challenges that that leader needs, or will face there and then? Deeply entrenched centers of power, embedded interests within the state. Explain those. That, that have are. captured, that, that, that have captured the state and are using it to their own advantage. Mm -hmm. The other is this ethic of uh, private gain over the public good. I think that if there's anything that has eaten at a cancer that has eaten at the influence of the Ugandan state and society is the loss of the public spirit in public service, that everybody is maneuvering. Which contract is there? How can I make a profit? How, whether the government benefits or not is really of limited significance. Everybody's strategizing. I should supply government and build it three times over, which sometimes is actually I would defend. You know why? Robert, if you supply government, it takes four years without paying you. Mm. Then you have borrowed from the bank. It is better you charge something 10 million even if it's 1 million mm. because of the delays. Anyway, but... That aside, which is a fact, sometimes I, I, I would defend people who overbuild government because of government's inability to pay mm, on time. Mm. I would say that we need to reconstruct the public ethic. This country needs to have a conversation on the future that we want and the kind of attitude and ethics that we need to build in order to drive towards that future. And I don't know whether that is possible in our context, but I think that in the context of a government of national unity where we're not throwing stones at each other, it is possible to have that conversation because people are not excluded. We need to think about how do we incorporate different political forces in power rather than how do we exclude us versus them, I think undermines that conversation. Just imagine if you put Bob Wayne and the Bessie and Museveni in one room to have a discussion and their supporters. It's likely to be a much more, uh, I don't know whether it will be an eating racket. I believe that they, they are likely to have a, a more focused discussion on the good of the country because they have resolved their inter, in, internal rivalries. Now they can focus on something bigger. Andrew, I just want to... Maybe I'm being idealistic. Do you think I'm being idealistic? Actually, Robert? I want to give you a, 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 a different trajectory. Um, and I want to tell you a story that this happened in 2015. Again, uh, during private conversations, political discussions, you know, those late night conversations. And people in the group were obsessed with two individuals in the presidential contest. They were obsessed with Amama Babazi, they were obsessed with BCJ. And my argument in the group at that time was that actually we need to stop this obsession with individuals. We need to worry about the grievances that drive people to support these individuals. If we don't address those, if we think that simply stopping and frustrating a particular political actor will solve the problem, what it means is that if you don't solve these grievances, another player is going to arrive on the scene who will take advantage and create a different political conversation. Two years mm -hmm. later, guess what? Bobby Wine arrived and he took the politics by the scruff of its neck, introduced Toji Kwatako, and the politics have been different ever since. My point, Andrew, yes. is that individual actors, while they may be able to agree on how to relate to each other, 
If we don't address the grievances of the broad majority, this majority will move and rally behind another player. Whether we like it or not. Well, that's true. Although my point was not that they should meet because they like each other, but that they should meet in order to have a national conversation. That it is difficult to have a national conversation when you're throwing stones at each other. But, but, like the Americans are doing. But Andrew, it's very possible. That's the whole point, mm. Andrew. That maybe we need to accept that it's not possible to construct a new political social contract by relying on only individuals. Maybe these individuals that we lionize politically and we think are the solution to our problems actually may not be. In fact, they may... Now, Robert, that poses the question. If we are going to... Because social movements will have to have a representative. You cannot have direct democracy of the Athenians in uh, 400 BC. <laughs> in the 4th century BC. You are likely to have but, a, a, a different social forces that are frustrated, that need a voice. They will have to be represented but by Andrew, the people they see as legitimate representatives of their aspirations. Yes. and, and So Andrew, those people are the ones to sit in a government of a national unity to argue the future of Uganda, the business community, the youth, the SMEs, the farmers, the teachers, the medical workers, different groups in Uganda have aspirations, and those aspirations have to be represented by particular people. They have to find those who articulate and represent their interests, and these people come together and maybe have a national conversation. I'm not very good so, as a prophet. I'm good yeah. as, as an analyst. Yeah. So, Andrew, I want to just put it to you this way. Uh, quite a few influential people uh, in, in, in PLU where you're politically active why don't you just point out the time bomb we're sitting on now and say, look, guys, maybe what we're actually dealing with is not what it is. The reality is as follows. And you maybe start reaching out to the traders who have made it, made it very clear that they are not happy with the taxation system. Efris. And not just efforts, by the way, they're they are now making it clear that many foreigners are entering their business and creating unfair advantage. They have all these advantages and they are protected from all of these things. So they, they have a grievance. So you have all these social categories that have grievances. You have doctors who have grievances. You have youth who have grievances. You have, can, are you able to take this message to those, these different power centers that the way they are approaching these issues isn't working? So I will take your voice to PLU. Just play the this recording, maybe. That. <laughs> yes. Okay. You so, send me the recording. I'll take it. By the way, I should tell you, Robert. Tell you the fact mm. is, uh, some of us on the PLU have been discussing uh, these issues. For example, we as PLU, what should be our position on IFRIS? This issue of the business community. What should be our issue on the Balalo? Our position on the Balalo. What should be our, our what should be our position on Kitezi? What should be our position on Kampala? And when we have met the president, we have raised these issues with him mm. in very frank discussions to say Kampala has to be fixed. Uh, this and this issue has to be addressed like this. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that, uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, mm -hmm. people see us as a mafia. Andrew, me and you know that, uh, of course, images and appearances matter. But, you see, PLU is not PLU. <laughs> Andrew, PLU. Is, what are you trying to no, say? No, no, I'm joking. I'm saying, Andrew, PLU is not noob. Noob is not in office. PLU has members who have power to affect outcomes. Surely, you can yes. demonstrate some of these things. I mean, there was a simple thing where your chairperson acted on returning some sanity to Kampala's roads by burning these little sirens. You could do a bit more, and many of you in PLU could do a bit more in terms of real action. Uh, some of your members yes, now. I ministers. agree. Balam is a minister. Nyamutoro is a minister. What can they do immediately to persuade the public that, yes, this, they, they are capable of doing certain things? You have given us a challenge. Okay, so let's... And, we'll, and we'll give you, we will invite you to coffee, even to talk to our SEC, our central committee. I mean, let me give you a very simple thing. Save the Uganda Coffee Development Authority from being sent to the Ministry of Agriculture because you're really burying the coffee sector by doing that. You will, do you know what the effect of that is, Andrew? It means that we are now... But they ask, Robert, I want to ask you, so when they're making these decisions, do they consult people in the coffee sector? No, they don't. They even ignore because we actually have made presentations and explained why it's important for this not to be done. The next thing we hear, the president doesn't want UCDA. He wants it back in the Ministry of Agriculture. I wish he knew what he is doing because what's going to happen is we're now going to be vulnerable to multinationals and we're going to be vulnerable to these crooks and thieves that are entering the sector to finish us. That's it. Now, it is things like this, Andrew, that when we go into public debate, we just expect as a minimum engagement. If every time people raise issues, people tell you about governance, people tell you about failure of the state, you dismiss them and mm. arrest them instead of solving. If the same energy that went into enforcing uh, uh, against these groups was taken into 50% of it into dealing with these problems, we wouldn't be here.
Mm, I agree with you. So, so, I, but yeah. you see, the failure to address the problems of the city leads to discontent. The response to discontent is not to address the problems, but to address the people who are complaining about it. So, I, I think that's the problem. Is, by the way, Robert, I should tell you, from a tactical strategy, I don't mind if you feel people are going to demonstrate and they may create instability that may lead to regime collapse. Hmm. The tactical thing to do is uh, to repress the protests. Once uh, Andrew, you there have, is a, Andrew, there is a at, difference. At, hold a second. Once you have achieved that objective, then you carry out the very reforms they are demanding at your own, uh, 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 at your own command. You see, you don't want to be forced by the streets the way Ruto did, that I'm yielding, because people will ban many things. But what is important for me, strategically, is that, yes, you may be able to suppress a protest, but don't forget the causes of the protest. You have to address those. That strategically address the causes on your own terms. When people protest, don't accept them to force you to do anything. Once you have contained the protest, that's a tactical move. The strategic move now is address the concerns that have led to this kind of crisis. Andrew, let's first... So, so the problem is not the short-term action they have taken. For me, it is the medium to long-term inaction exactly. on the issues that are stimulating this resistance. Uh, but Andrew, let's also draw a distinction between regime collapse and state collapse. The two are completely different. You can act. Well, I, I think that I think that if you are President Kavshenga, yeah. you don't want your government to collapse. But, but, so you'll defend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just pointing out to you that that actually, I agree. Force yeah. should only be applied to protect the state from collapsing because there everybody is a loser. But you see, these collapses can take place. There you have become a big. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that these collapses. <laughs> you may, but I don't think even in the Vatican that philosophy applies. No. The church is not like that. Also. But Andrew, you know so, what happened mm. in China that when mm. Deng Xiaoping experienced uh, student uprisings of 1989 in Tiananmen Square. Mm. He suppressed them violently, and many people were killed. But he yes. understood that from that point onwards, the social contract between the Communist Party of China and the people of China was that the Communist Party of China would have to deliver prosperity in order for them to maintain political control in the manner that they did. You can't... So, so, so Robert, hold it there. So that's the point I was making. That from a, from a tactical point of view, it is not always good for a leader to yield pressure from protesters. So what the bank did is one, crush them mercilessly and retain political stability and momentum, then address those issues on your own terms at your own calling. Don't allow people only to direct how you are present. And we're good at that. Oh, that he, when people threatened to demonstrate and he did heavily that he actions to rein in civil government, although I don't think he can succeed. Why, Robert? You see, corruption in Uganda has become so widely spread that today mm. I think it is the way this, the system works, not the way the system fails. Okay. okay. It's the way the system, not the, because you see, the NRM government relies on corruption to, mm. to reproduce its power. Mm. If you want to look, if you look at how power is organized, how power is exercised, how power is distributed, and how it is reproduced, mm. you'll find that the anchor, the glue that holds the edifice of this uh, heterogeneous coalition of different uh, forces within the NRM mm. is. Corruption. In fact, I wonder if you were to start corruption out of the system, it's likely to lead not to only regime collapse, but also state collapse, because the state itself functions around corruption. We need to reimagine the state in Uganda and re-engineer it mm. in a way that makes corruption not the foundation on which it is constructed. Mm. But corruption and patronage is the, is the fuel of the system. It's the oxygen that allows it to breathe and survive. Andrew, so how, this neatly brings me to the point I wanted to raise with you. And this, so for me, it's an issue I've been reflecting on. What if and this is a big one for me. What if you pass the tipping point and corruption ceases to be the way the system works, but becomes the way the system is undermined from within? And I think that's where we are reaching, Robert. We are reaching there. You know, Montesquieu argued that uh, yeah. Rome collapsed mm. because having built itself to subsist with an army, mm. he says that Rome collapsed because it ran out of money. Mm. Having conditioned itself subsist with an army, it found itself in a position whereby it could not subsist with an army. It could no longer pay its army. Having, our system having designed itself to survive and subsist on corruption, it's reaching a point where it is finding that it cannot, it cannot subsist mm. with that corruption mm. because it becomes a huge expense, not just on the finances of the state, but on the kind of mentality that it is building because young people get angry. But, I mean, how but, can but, people like that speak of parliament be involved in such obvious abuse of the public uh, office, and nothing is done. But how, how can that happen? There was a time there was Kazila, he went to jail, there was Obey, they went to jail. There have been many corruption scandals. I remember the Sam Kutesas and the Jonas Sassilas were prosecuted in Kenya, went to prison. You understand? And, there was corruption then, but there was a pretense to take action. Andrew, let me just point. But now, yeah. 
Now, uh, the president goes open and defends the thieves. Exactly. And you say, now what is this? But Andrew, that's the whole point that I was making to you, that you see, even the president's strategic interests that he talks about, you cannot deliver on those outcomes dealing with thieves. We also know, at least I know of some cases, where there's been fabricated intelligence reports and Mm. being sent about people. This is all part of the decay that corruption brings. Now, you cannot uh, put uh, barriers or deploy soldiers against that kind of collapse. So the question is, how prepared are we as a country? How prepared is the establishment for this effect, for the collapse? Because that is an option that we cannot uh, look away from. If we're dependent on thieves and on the decay, I mean, you're going to have a GTZ, but this time of the political establishment, it just collapse. Well, I hope I hope that your predictions are wrong, because uh, Uganda they will not have collapse, will not collapse. <laughs> but the fear is that we run the risk of a serious crisis if certain processes are not arrested. You know, we have one advantage in Uganda, mm. and that advantage is that one, you have uh, a large educated middle class that has accumulated property, and I think have a vested interest in stability. Mm-hmm. That is that is one. Two, you have uh, a military that is unified and strong enough to hold the political order. Mm-hmm. You see, I have a view. Uh, th- those are the two things. Mm-hmm. And I hope that uh, the military and uh, this educated middle class, because remember, I have told you, Robert, mm-hmm. that if you move around Uganda, this country has been so successful. If you remember in the 1990s, we used to drive on Kampala Road at uh, 120 kilometers per mm-hmm. hour. So many people have built houses, businesses, homes, and things like that. They have a vested interest in, in a, a significant number of elites in Uganda have a vested interest in a stable political order. Mm-hmm. They have so much at stake. But we have a large community of dispossessed Ugandans in urban areas mm-hmm. who have nothing to lose even if it meant burning down this city. Yes. Those can be contained tactically by the military, but, by the UPDF. But I can tell you, UPDF itself is a product of the Ugandan society. The exactly. of Uganda. So if you put, if you put 10,000 demonstrators on the streets, police will disperse them. If you put 200,000, the army back, rather police backed by the army may contain them. But if you put there 1 million, for the next three weeks, it's very likely the police and the army may join them. Soldiers may refuse to take orders. So you don't want to run that risk if you were, if I was in certain shoes, or the shoes of anybody in the government, to say that at any one time this military can hold. In the military, people in the military can change, especially when they see so many but, things but, but, so but, wrong. Andrew, I want to... And, and the soldiers have to defend a front line. When the front line of the people has shifted, I don't think UPDF as is constituted can fight the people of Uganda. No, of course it cannot. Seven but Andrew, there, there, is yes, also, there is also, let's look at what happened to, to, to Mobutu. That Mo, Mobutu mm-hmm. was completely hollowed out because of corruption. And, yes. and, and it's very possible that, yes, you, and that's because the state was vested in protecting these tendencies. So if a state is protecting corrupt tendencies of political actors and public servants, regardless of political color or shade, the ability of the state to function will be ultimately undermined. And therefore, I agree. if the state can't respond to just basic problems like TTZ, it's not just that it is a collapse. It is that there was simply no response. Nobody took responsibility. Nobody even came. The president hasn't been to Chitez. It's only, uh, what's her name, Nabanja, who went there, laughed around and boarded a plane and went to Italy. Nobody else has been there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I should tell you, Robert, that even very strong governments with, who, who, who had presided over successful economies like in Indonesia, mm. you know they fell under the weight of these kinds of things. Mm. Uh, Suharto in Indonesia presented with a very successful economy. Yes. Uh, Park Chang He in South Korea. Same story. Uh, and the, the general that succeeded him, uh, Chang Du Huan and uh, Ro Tai Won, mm. Won Tai Ro, mm. all of them had been very successful. They had presented over very successful economies, but they did not manage the politics. I think that the biggest risk Uganda runs is that they're not managing the politics very well. Mm. You remember, uh, Robert, that Nyerere presented over catastrophic economic failure. Yes. In Tanzania. But there was never a strong political movement against him because Nyerere positioned his politics and actions in a manner that demonstrated that he serves the interests of the people of Tanzania. So that they were able to sympathize with him when his policies went totally wrong and impoverished them, but they knew he was acting in good faith. Here, the problem is that Ugandans don't believe that the president is acting in good faith. They think, as he has himself said, that he works for himself and his family. Mm. And I think that is a very, very bad mentality for people to have. And we need to reconstruct faith of the public in him as a champion of the public good. Can he... But when he associates himself with people who have stolen, refuses to punish them, doesn't answer the cries of the people in Kampala for roads that have fallen apart, doesn't address the cries of the youth who cannot get jobs. Let me tell you, Robert, by the mm. way, even if, uh, uh, even if mm. it, he failed to achieve creating jobs for everyone, mm. 
it is possible to have a political project that creates hope in people that the government is actively working for your interest. Even if today you are not served, mm. or at least opportunities have not reached you, that this government is really working towards that set goal. You get yes. it? There is hope. I, I can tell you, I go to Rwanda. I see young people who left university uh, two years ago. They haven't found a job. Maybe they have gone two days or, two, or a day without a meal. But if you ask them, they tell you they have uh, a positive view of the future of the country. And they feel like the government is working for them, mm. to create opportunities for them. And, and this is the issue I was telling you about Nyerere, who presided over catastrophic economic failure. Mm. At least people believed that he's trying to work for the good of the country. Mm. And that is what Uganda is lacking. People here think a government is working for the good of a few individuals who hold power. And you, everybody else, has been excluded. And, and I think that is the power. It's not simply a failure. It is the failure to articulate a vision of the country and rally people around that vision. And, but I don't think that we have reached a point where Uganda can change and project that vision. I don't think so. so I think we have passed that stage. So, so, so in the last minutes, uh, you know, me and you are now uh, fairly old, so we should be going to bed pretty soon. The question is, if you, Andrew Mwenda, today were given the sole authority to determine which direction we should go to rebuild that trust, what would you do? So I have told you the first things I will do. I will first create the government of national unity and bring the different interested parties mm. on the same table to say, can we agree on a minimum program on which all of us can work together for the good of the country? And what would that program look like? That's what happened. Let us invest in... That's what happened in 1986 in Nabingo yes. between, the, pre- between exactly. the president so, and Simo Gelli. Yes. So what do I say? They bring the ideas, I bring my ideas, and we, 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 we do a blueprint of what we want to do in the first five or six or seven years. Yeah. And we try to stick to that. Mm. That uh, if we want to address problems of the youth, how do we get the youth involved yes. in economic activity that gives them opportunity and hope? Yeah. How do we communicate our actions to the public? Mm. You know, right, there are three pillars of power. Yeah. First is economic power. Mm. The second is military power. Mm. The third, and I think most important, is soft power. Yes. Which is, the is when they came here, they used called siasa. Yes. The ability to, so there's ability to bribe, that's economic power. The ability to coerce, that is military power. Mm. And the ability to convince, mm. which is soft power, mm. uh, siasa. Mm. I think that the NRM has moved away mm. from uh, siasa, so they don't have any project of how to win the hearts and minds mm. of anybody. Mm. Uh, they have retreated too. We either bribe you, and those who cannot be bribed, we coerce you. Mm. We will beat you on the streets. Mm. I think that the abandonment of that third pillar of power, soft power, has been grossly detrimental to the interest of Museveni, his legacy, and that of the NRM. But also partly because the party is completely, the NRM as it used to be, has been completely hollowed out. Uh, its, institution, yeah, that's true. its institutional memory is gone. It has no resources. It's just, it's just it only comes alive during elections and then com- goes into limbo, comes back with a new set of guys. I mean, there is just no political mobilization. I think that uh, the emasculation of NRM from being a political party to being uh, a seasonal uh, makeshift organization to run elections for the president has been a deliberate strategy to undermine the party becoming a center of power. So then what is left as a political institution by which you then call others and say, okay, uh, Noop guys, you come, uh, DP, you come, because even when you went to negotiate with DP, he negotiated with Mao, uh, and he took him out. When you went to FDC, he took out the speaker and her people. Uh, you... So you have answered my point, Robert, about the, the movement. The movement was never conducted in good faith. <laughs> it was about co-opting individuals of other political parties. You see, the same strategy has remained, and that strategy is not a good strategy, actually. You know, you can win over individuals instead of winning over constituencies. Well, I, I, I can imagine that tactically you can say that if you cut off the head, which is leadership, you separate it from the body, followership, the body is unlikely to function. But it also can be that a, 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 a group that you leave that is not led either, as you said earlier, it can get an alternative leader. Oh, for that matter, it can act as a mob. Mobs don't build things, they destroy things. Mm. And those are the mobs that uh, you saw in Libya. Mm. Yes. So Uganda needs to think, and those who are in charge of NRM, I can see your phone upon his online uh, listening. Mm. He should take a message to the NRM that NRM as a political party needs to be reconfigured. It needs to exist as an entity. Because in any case, if there is to be any succession in Uganda, it will require a party. Right now, I don't think the NRM exists as a, an institution and as a party. So, uh, Andrew, me and you uh, have had a long conversation, two hours long. Um, and I'm also now intellectually exhausted. Uh, yeah, me, me, physically my, and intellectually exhausted. Uh, me, I am also one hour uh, after my bedtime. These days, I, I like going to bed at 9 p.m. But what advice? Forget about your political leanings and shades. Now I want you to go back to Andrew Mwenda. What would you tell 
the young activists who are trying to define the country they want. Ha! Huh. I need to go back to my sleep. Then tomorrow I wake up and rest for them to do the same. And I think you should, Andrew, because apart yes. from you know the political positions you've been taking lately, I mean, let's leave that aside. You've been a very consequential public figure in terms of debate and thought. Me and you owe it to the new generation to point out that this is these would be useful methods or ways in which you articulate the future that you want. But I think, in all fairness, we we should encourage them to articulate because they can't work. They they have to inherit this country. Unfortunately, people are stealing their future right now. Now, since we have two minutes, I can say this. Mm. The one thing I can tell them is that, you see, anger mm. does not create power. Mm. That uh, what young people need to do is if they should, they should, uh, they should organize their anger into purposeful political behavior. And to do that, they must have a clear articulation of what they want and how they want to achieve it. Because there is not only one way of how you ca they can achieve the ends. I personally believe achieving regime change may be your best option, but it may not be a possible option. Mm. Um, engaging NRM and uh, becoming a major players in it and pushing the president in a particular direction. And I think, he's, as I told you at the beginning, he's a man who listens. Could be a very important beginning point. So I will tell younger people, maybe we should all join the PLU in Houston, Hosey, to talk to his father. To I'm, I'm sending you an know. invoice for... <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Andrew, I tell you, Andrew, for Robert, me. people may dismiss this. No, eh? Andrew, for the me. best chance for Uganda Andrew, mm, for me. to have a peaceful transition for eh? me, what I'll tell them to do. Could be all the possible transition could be PLU. I'm very serious on this. Well, you are, you are, you're just one. There are also others who think a transition to Bobby Wine would be better. There are those who think a transition to uh, FDC or VSJ. So it, Clearly, you invited me to give my own opinion and you asked me to give advice. <laughs> my advice. Okay. I give the advice of those Andrew, <laughs> so, but what I would yes. tell them is that I think the most interesting history of resistance is the history of the countries that used to be in Eastern Europe as part of the Warsaw Pact. I mean, they took completely different routes and achieved exactly the same outcome, whether it was Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania. So I think that the world history is rich with options and that our young people should study them. It pays to read. Andrew Mwenda, thank you so much for spending time with us this evening, for coming to Africa and Speak. I appreciate your time and your perspective. Thank you so much, Robert, for inviting an old man to give his outdated ideas to young people. Thank you very much, folks, for sitting out the last two hours. It is now 10 p.m. in Kampala, and therefore, good night and have a great week.